So I, I wanted to talk about uh, one of the successes of, of uh, diagrammatic Monte Carlo in, in addressing a uh, long-standing physical problem of, of how uh, an insulator develops in, in two-dimensional Hubbard model. And uh, I'll start with thanking my collaborators. Uh, uh, part of the work was a PhD work of, of Federer, who is now in, in uh, Paris. Uh, uh, it's, part of the work was done by, by Aram, and recently we were joined by a uh, PhD student, Connor, and uh, a major part of the work was done in collaboration with James, uh, Nikolai, Boris, and Eugene. So, uh, as, as a quick motivation, I just, just wanted to point out that uh, current experiments in cold particle atoms have, 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 have reached quite uh, non-trivial regimes of long-range correlations, and these are regimes which are actually quite challenging to uh, address with, with current uh, methods we have. But most interestingly, they've, they've um, reached temperatures low enough to actually study the, uh, the metal insulator physics. And it will be quite useful to actually address this problem uh, in, in a controllable way so that they can actually go there and, and measure what is predicted. So the problem. <clears throat> uh, you know, the main ingredient, of course, of, of the Hubbard model with half feeling is that the Fermi surface is nested and there's a natural uh, tendency towards anti-ferromagnetic instability. Uh, in particular, the, the uh, ground state is uh, always kept for any non-zero value of U. Uh, however, there is a competing effect, effect of course. The uh, Raymond Wagner theorem tells, tells us that there's actually no long range order. So the problem becomes, um, um, unless the temperature is zero, so the problem becomes uh, quite, quite non-trivial. Uh, and when, when the correlations, when, 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 when the um, anti-ferromagnetic anti-ferromagnetic um, anti anti magnetism is, 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 is suppressed, uh, we, the problem has been studied very thoroughly. Uh, and pioneers actually of solving the problem uh, are, are, are in this audience. And uh, it's, it's well understood that it's expected that the, the system will undergo a metal to insulated transition. However, uh, in the pure to the Hubbard model, uh, it's, there's, there's not so, so much actually where, where the anti magnetism is, is uh, the, the main effect. Uh, not so much has been, has been done in, in a controlled way, perhaps uh, the most advanced work is, is, uh, is, is this one done by, by Thomas and, and collaborators, where very advanced uh, methods were used to actually demonstrate that the uh, insulator appears uh, in a crossover. <clears throat> and however, uh, it, the, the study already demonstrated that the, the problem is, is, is very challenging because the uh, correlation length uh, was, was found to be very large across, across the crossover. And it's, it's really difficult to uh, obviously extract uh, reliable results from finite size calculations. I mean, uh, DGMIA, of course, is, is, is an infinite size system method, although it uses meshes to uh, um, deal with, with the case space. But, but any finite size method like quantum Monte Carlo is probably going to be suffering quite, quite a lot. <clears throat> So diagrammatic Monte Carlo, as, as, as we know very well, is, is precisely uh, suitable for these kind of things because it works directly in the, in the uh, thermodynamic limit where an observable is expressed as, uh, a, well, in one formulation, the Taylor expansion with respect to certain auxiliary expansion parameter. Um, and uh, the general setup that is used is this way I've seen over these two years, um, is, is typically um, one with, with an effective action where we introduce uh, some arbitrary field in our effective actions, add, add and subtract, treat part of it in, in the Green's function. Um, well, it can serve different purposes as, as we've seen in, in yesterday, it could improve, uh, it could improve convergence of the series in, uh, or in, in fact, today in, in uh, Christian's talk, uh, it, it greatly helps. But we, we're using it mainly for, for uh, improving the Monte Carlo efficiency. But then, but then the, uh, 
observables, correlation functions in particular, uh, would be given by a Taylor expansion of this auxiliary expansion parameter. And uh, computing the coefficients, uh, well, at least in the parameter regime of, of relevance to this problem, is most efficiently done by a family of determinantal diagrammatic uh, methods. Well, the, the, the idea that, that Ricardo suggested, which builds on, on earlier work, you know, where it was realized that uh, a determinant building Green's functions sums all uh, possible diagrammatic topologies, it was used very successfully to compute the partition function and, well, simulate sample the partition function, simulate the statistics for, for the partition function, and uh, was realized by Ricardo that, in fact, you can subtract all the disconnected diagrams out of, out of a factorial number of diagrams, which you can compute very cheaply <coughs> with uh, you know, only uh, n cubed operations. You can subtract all the disconnected ones in just an exponential uh, number of steps. Naively, one would expect that to be factorial. That's only exponential. And in fact, uh, as, as Federer pointed out to me, at some point, you can actually do it uh, using fast subset convolutions. And, in uh, n squared 2 to the n. But, 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 but actually, the leading cost, uh, typically, if you, if you do it straightforwardly, the leading cost of, of, of this subtraction is computing all the sub uh, determinants, all, all, all the principal minors of, of, of the determinant, of the, of the main determinant that you're actually subtracting here. And that scales as n cubed 2 to the n. Uh, 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 however, uh, in his PhD work, Federer came up with, with a nice way of, of improving this. And, and that's not a bottleneck anymore. It's just a order 2 to the end. That was actually a very important improvement for us, which allowed us to, to go to slightly higher orders and, and improve our uh, accuracy. <clears throat> now, uh, and, and as, as I'll show, this works very well for, for uh, correlation functions. Uh, uh, but we also want to be able to compute self-energies. And while well, it's quite natural to extend this idea by subtracting uh, all irreducible diagrams, uh, it just, just you know, can be done similar, uh, in a similar number of, of, of steps, just slightly higher uh, times n squared. Um, uh, and you know, there, there are different technical implementations. Uh, the Paris group has, has, has done a similar thing. Um, uh, we, we have this, this algorithm that, that works in, in, in the momentum space, uh, which, which we find convenient for, for, for certain problems. So however, uh, this is indeed an efficient way of computing the uh, coefficients of, of, of the series. But once you've uh, computed them, and you can, you can go to uh, quite high orders, uh, well, the, here I'm, I'm showing the, the results for up to 10th order. Uh, this is you know, imaginary self-energy uh, as a function of inverse diagram order. You, you, you see that, that even though you know all the coefficients, of course, uh, the answer does not make any sense because the series diverges. And, and we come to you know, what was discussed at length uh, yesterday, how to actually extract a physical answer out of, out of knowing these coefficients once we're able to compute them with, with decent accuracy. To really high order, uh, the approach that that we take is well. We, we start by locating the singularity on the complex plane by just looking at the simple ratio test. We, we can find it roughly like this, and uh, well, and for this particular data, it's, it's minus five. Uh, we don't need it to know the location of singularity too accurately because what we do first is that we. We apply a conformal map. I, I don't need to go into details. It was discussed uh, at length by like Xavier. So, yeah. uh, but you know, I just, just want to mention that typically the singularity on, on the negative real axis, they, uh, it's expected to correspond to the superfluid transition. So the type of the singularity is not a simple pull, typically. It's, it's uh, some kind of branch cut. Uh, um, uh, along, along the real axis. Uh, and, and we use a map that maps this branch cut onto the unit circle so that the physical uh, parameter, the expansion parameter xi, 
uh, which is one uh, at when, when the one evaluated the, the series uh, is within this, this unit uh, circle. And indeed, if we, if we use this, well, this particular map, uh, we, we see that, that the series that we obtain actually does converge. However, it converts, I mean, first of all, we see that it's the, the second singularity, again, we can run the ratio test on the, um, on the transform series. We see that the second singularity is, is at uh, u around 9, which is higher than the one that we're evaluating at, this particular beta r for u7. So the series converges, but it does converge quite, quite slowly. So we still need to uh, extrapolate the series. And, and the way we do it is uh, using this so-called integral approximate technique, approximate technique, which is the idea is essentially uh, to uh, approximate uh, the self energy as a function of the expansion parameter by a function that has the same uh, Taylor series up to the maximum order that we have and solves uh, this uh, ordinary differential equation. So, and, and, and Q, P, R are polynomials of, of the corresponding orders, and <coughs> is obviously constrained to the number of orders of, of, or, or that, that you can have given a certain number of coefficients that you've computed for the series. Uh, so, uh, this, this may look uh, unfamiliar, but you're probably familiar with with its special cases of this, of this approximate technique. Well, the, the uh, well-known Padet approximate technique is just a special case when this Q is zero. And, and the uh, logarithmic derivative Padet approximate technique, which is slightly more powerful, it allows you to deal with algebraic singularities. This one is uh, a special case when, when the uh, right-hand side of the equation is zero. And, and by the way, this is all, of course, old school 1970s approaches, which proved quite uh, very powerful, actually, for, for uh, locating phase transitions and all sorts of familiar continuations in field theory. So <clears throat> the, uh, of course, the, ge the more general integral approximate technique is, is, uh, has an advantage that it has quite a general structure of, um, of, of, of this approximate. Well, first of all, the singularities are found directly as zeros of this uh, of this function q. So it's you know there's, there's no, no problem to find where the singularities are with an error bar if you want, uh, of course. Uh, and close to the singularity, the, the form of the of the approximant is is uh, that of an algebraic singularity plus some regular part, uh, and which is which is quite typical for a phase transition. So we uh, expect it to, to be quite powerful in, in, in capturing the structure of, in capturing the uh, asymptotics of, of our series, except, of course, in, in 2D, we don't really uh, know what the uh, structure of the series, what, 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 what the structure of the phase transition is, uh, because the phase transition is, is a very, uh, quite a difficult analytic structure, typically cost of established type. But, but we see that there's no, uh, as, as I'll show in, in a minute, there, there's no uh, discrepancy from this approach beyond the error bars, which, which validates itself consistently. So if, if, if there was any discrepancy uh, of, of, of if, if we could resolve any difference from, from this uh, general uh, um, asymptotic stuff of our answer, we, 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 we would see that. that uh, we would have to modify this approach further, but we see that within the error bars, there's no need for it. Right. So uh, we can also do the same thing, essentially, in, the, in an autom automatic way, without any conformal map. So you can just apply the integral approximate approach to the original series. Uh, and it will immediately give us the two singularities that, that we have, uh, that we have discovered through the consecutive conformal maps with certain error bar. And it has some, some noise, of course. And, and it will give us the approximate values of, of the powers of these singularities. Okay, So those are generally, of course, branch cut singularities. And uh, so, so it does give you a lot of information about 
the structure of the series automatically, and also it's a nice tool to control the accuracy because uh, you know what, what what I need to do is is I need to plot my answer as as a function of different choices of of those uh, formerly arbitrary m, l, and n. There's some reasons uh, to uh, expect some of them to be more adequate than, than others. But if you if you do it for different uh, uh, choices that and, and observe that the answer does not depend on the choice that that gives you confidence that your error bar is under control and, and you've captured the uh, analytic structure of, of the series so actually I should say that a lot of work goes into actually seeing how this thing breaks down and, and test uh, trying different cases that you, you cook up and just to see how reliable that is and and indeed uh, we've seen that it uh, it works as we expect it to. Here you have quantum terms, the original series. It, it, has, it has just, just the basic counter term, which is a shift of the chemical potential. Right, just basically, yes, removes, removes, um, yes, just the chemical potential shift. Right, okay, so, and, uh, and then, of course, we can repeat because now it's now it's all automatic, uh, automatic, automated. Uh, we can we can repeat this uh, for for different momentum points of the self energy quite quite straightforwardly and reconstruct, for instance, the momentum dependence of the self energy. Uh, we can we can use that to find the, for instance, the momentum uh, distribution. In, in the system and see that you know for this particular regime of U7 temperature 0.2 and some 6% doping it's quite non uh, quite different from from the non-interacting system uh, and and I should say that that uh, currently it's 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 the best one can do for the self energy we that I, I don't think there's any method that can can do it with arbitrary momentum resolution and in this in this particular regime right Okay, so back to the uh, to the metal to insulator crossover problem. Um, well, the um, uh, having access to the self energy allows us to identify essentially quasi particle properties from, from looking at the at the self energy. We use the standard um, approach of uh, well, we, we just look at the self energy as a function of of, of, of frequency, and if, if if the self energy bends up, uh, it's uh, well, it's the imaginary part of the self energy. It's 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 considered to be metallic, and and um, an insulator uh, corresponds to a pole developing at zero frequency. Uh, and so we see when it bends down, we we call it uh, a generally non-fermi liquid. If it happens along the whole Fermi surface, we call it uh, an insulator. And and the crossover is essentially just we define it as 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 the location when when the lowest uh, when the values of, of uh, the self energy at the lowest mutual bar frequencies change places, so when it goes from going up to going down, it changes the difference, changes sign. Uh, we call that crossover. So the result, it was flashed yesterday uh, in Michelle's talk, um, is well, essentially, uh, this is the diagram in, in, the, in the temperature in U plane, where uh, we see that as. You know, we start low enough temperatures, we, 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 we see good uh, metallic behavior in the self energy. Uh, as we increase the U or lower the temperature further, we see that the um, self energy becomes gapped first at the antinodal point. And then as, uh, as we uh, keep lowering the temperature, increasing the U, the Fermi surface, uh, the, the gap proliferates across the Fermi surface and eventually reaches the antinodal point here, beyond which the uh, Fermi surfaces, the Fermi surfaces, is 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 fully gapped. So it's quite it's quite interesting that um, the the metal insulator crossover essentially completes within this kind of low U, which normally be considered to be a low U range of up to about four. So beyond four, as one lowers the temperature, you enter essentially into the you know qualitatively Heisenberg physics well, without any um, ungapped uh, excitations whenever you can um, define those. Right, so um, we can also uh, look at 
uh, well, something that is actually observable. I mean, the problem, of course, with the self energy is that you cannot observe that in an experiment, but you can, you can at least observe the uh, momentum distribution, and we see that momentum distribution evolves across the crossover, uh, where you know, we, we start with something which is more resembling of the Fermi surface, but then as, as we cross over to uh, the insulating regime, then um, here at the antinodal points, the momentum distribution is suppressed and it becomes more circular uh, inside the insulating regime. We can also look at how the self-energy in, in the K-space in the brilliant zone increases. Well, expectedly, it starts with, with the antinodal points and then becomes bigger uh, at the uh, node eventually. But uh, this one, I think, is quite interesting because here you see the difference between the uh, two lowest Mutsubara frequencies, and, and the blue uh, shading corresponds to insulator-like behavior, and, 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 and the red corresponds to metal-like behavior. And you see how increasing the U, the uh, Fermi surface becomes gradually gapped uh, everywhere. Right. So, uh, however, it, it's, it's important to keep in mind that our criterion for uh, the metal to insulator is, is, is somewhat conservative because it, is, it would be uh, quite natural, actually, to expect that, uh, well, before we have this curve bending down, like this curve is already not exactly thermoliquid. It does show no thermoliquid properties. So actually, uh, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to look at the uh, physical observables that one can actually go and measure. and, and and there we see that, uh, oh, it's surprising why it became blurry. It was OK in my, in my computer. Sorry for that. Uh, so uh, it's a busy plot. But basically, uh, one point that, that, that I can make right away is that um, in, in, in physical observables, for instance, in compressibility, the crossover begins earlier. And, and the, the separation between uh, scales between the well, well, metallic behavior and insulator behavior becomes even wider. So the system becomes uh, um, non thermo liquid. Uh, well, I should, I should maybe make an aside that it have feeling, you know, thermo liquid is not the typical thermo liquid. So when I say non thermo liquid, I don't mean uh, the, you know, non T squared behavior. It's not T squared anyway. There's logarithmic corrections to uh, everything. Uh, but uh, in the sense that it has metallic quasi-particle properties. Right, so, so the system becomes non-metallic uh, before the self-energy. So the self-energy data here are uh, the ones I showed in the previous slide are, are the green points. And, and uh, I'm going to guide you through, through the, so this figure gradually. Uh, so let's start with, let's start with double, double occupancy. So one, when, when one looks at double occupancy, yeah, oh yes. Uh, so it has, um, an interesting, quite, quite, quite actually um, characteristic, as I'll argue, uh, um, non-monotonic uh, behavior. Because you know, as as you lower the temperatures, double occupancy function of temperature, as you lower the temperature, it first goes down, and then it it starts rising again, and then it goes down. So that corresponds to to you know this cut, for, for example, and in here uh, the. Um, the points by the arrows are actually these, 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 these red points. The red points, they um, enclose an area where the derivative of double occupancy with respect to temperature is, is, is negative. And this, this has importance, uh, well, due to the Maxwell relation, essentially here, the derivative of entropy with respect to U is positive. So in fact, here, if, if, if you're in this regime, as was noted by, by Felix and, and co-workers a long time ago, here, if you, if you increase interaction adiabatically, you will be cooling the system. Uh, it's a wide, wide regime here. However, just an approach to the insulator regime, um, what happens is that the uh, sign of the derivative all, always of, of double occupancy, uh, of double occupancy all, always changes. So you always have a positive slope on approach to the insulator. And that corresponds to the development of the local magnetic moment before um, you can support the uh, well antiferromagnetic insulator state. Now, <clears throat> uh, compressibility offers a more direct 
uh, a means of, of, of um, observing insulating behavior, in particular, in, in, in a half-field metal, the derivative of compressibility with respect to temperature is negative. Uh, in, in the insulating regime, uh, it is clearly positive. So we see as uh, of the, well, the, the, these red points correspond to the points where the derivative changes sign. And, and, and we see that that happens quite early, but it's quite useful quite early compared to you know, all, all the other uh, processes that I'm going to mention. But uh, it's quite useful to uh, break down the compressibility into uh, local and non-local contributions. Um, it's just a sum, well, it's related to the density correlations and, and, and clearly it's just, just some um, of, 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 of just the trace of this correlator. And we see that, that, that the net local contribution has a, side, a sign that is opposite to, to the non-local contribution. So actually the net compressibility is a result of, of, of near cancellation of local and non-local uh, fluctuations in, in, in density correlations, which is, which is quite non-trivial. In fact, if, if we were to switch off the, all the non-local effects, then this, this, this crossover line in compressibility would be moved beyond the double occupancy crossover line. So the, the non-local in this regime of, of the uh, non-fermi liquid behavior, the non-local correlations are crucial, and we can look in more details of what they look like. I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, we, we can see how the so-called correlation hole develops as we increase the interaction. Um, uh, basically, well, hole, as the name implies, just uh, uh, punches out some, some, some uh, density around, uh, around, around, around a, 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 a particle due to uh, interactions. Well, in, interestingly, the magnetic uh, correlations are uh, quite, when, when, when we uh, look at the spin-spin correlation function and the correlation length, and the correlation length in the correlated regime is quite not so high when, when uh, the crossover happens. It becomes, it becomes of order 10 only uh, b below this, this, this um, blue line. And, and, and this is also quite natural for a correlated uh, for a correlated regime. In fact, as we, uh, if, if we consider the crossover at lower temperatures and lower U values, then, then the uh, uh, correlation length, magnetic correlation length at which the crossover happens becomes progressively longer and longer, corresponding to the physics become, becoming uh, more and more mean field-like. Right. So, uh, and uh, the magnetic crossover is, is easier seen in, in the uniform spin susceptibility which, well, generally deviates from the Curieux's law below temperature one, but it actually experiences a, a, a maximum, and then it's supposed to go down, but we don't have the accuracy to show nice data below this, but we can identify the maximum, and the maximum is given by this, uh, the uh, blue um, uh, closed um, circles. Uh, we can also look at the structure factor. I, I, I'm not going to go into details. It has some interesting effects and in isotropies, uh, etc. Uh, and interestingly, in, in the uh, we can see the signature of this non-fermi liquid regime, uh, which you know, which happens between between the, um, um, the compressibility crossover and the magnetic crossover where, you know, basically we can look at the derivative of, of the kinetic energy with respect to temperature and, and, and see that it has a maximum where the maximum corresponds to the beginning of the non fermi liquid regime, somewhere uh, around this line, and then, and then it changes sign as it should actually in, in its later insulator uh, below um, the insulator line. The temperature derivative of, of the kinetic energy becomes becomes negative, but you know, by looking at the, uh, at the plot, we can identify which regime corresponds to non-fermi liquid. It's the one between the maximum, uh, well, well, clearly in the fermi liquid, uh, the derivative is positive, and it keeps growing, in fact, but it reaches the maximum just, just where we transition to the non-fermi liquid. Right, so just, just to flash, I, I, need, I, I know I need to wrap up, but just, just to flash uh, uh, the slide, it's, it's, it's actually quite interesting that we can infer a lot of information about the nature of the physics by, by considering na na yeah, the nature of the physics of the system by considering uh, the entropy curve. So if, if, if I plot 
uh, a family of curves corresponding to different U values. I mean, obviously, I, I immediately see uh, regions where, where I have adiabatic cooling by increasing the U. So my entropy rises with U here. But then on approach to half filling, I see that, that, the, uh, that there's, there, there's, a, there's a crossover and entropy uh, starts going down as a function of, uh, sorry, it it's, uh, goes, goes up as I increase, uh, well, goes down as I increase the U. Right, so the behavior changes. Uh, and, uh, and that corresponds, of course, to, to, to the fact that close to half feeling we need to form the magnetic moment. And, and as I argued uh, a few slides ago, uh, this, this derivative corresponds to the, to the uh, contribution to the magnetic, uh, to, to the uh, local magnetic moment. Uh, also, the uh, appearance of the inflection point at high U's uh, signals that the change uh, of, of the derivative in compressibility happens. Which, which also gives us an indication that the system transitions from being metal-like on, on the left of this line to insulator-like <coughs> on the right of this line. All right, so with this, I'm going to leave my uh, final slide. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.